It's a real privilege and a pleasure to be with you. And as we wrestle with the convenience of uh, technology, I want to share with you the, the great privilege I feel it to be with you. And the gratitude for the work that has been done, for the excellent venue, the, uh, the good food. I don't know if any of you have enjoyed the good food. And the inspirational uh, music that has been provided for us. The power of God's love. What a powerful... Um, I beg your pardon, just to get this. I was deeply impressed by that piece of music, the power of your love, of God's love, that He wraps His arm around us. And we have already prayed, but I'm going to invite you to bow your heads once more as we thank God for His Spirit. Father, we pray that You will be with us in a tangible way through Your Spirit. That Your voice will be heard to speak. That Your Spirit will be felt. That Your angels will be present. And that we will leave this place different to the way we came. Because we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, I really appreciate your very kind and generous introduction and wondered whether folk wouldn't have had a little trouble with my name because uh, wherever I go, they, they don't get the Lazarus part. <laughs> and in some places, they don't get the Peter part. But very recently, I had the privilege of being in Mexico, in Sonora. And we had a wonderful time there. It was really a beautiful uh, visit, uh, beautiful people. And I was renamed Pedro Santiera. Santiera, Peter Landless. So if you have any question, Pedro Santiera. And I was traveling with a very good friend of yours and a good friend of mine, Elder Armando Miranda, who, uh, as we were traveling to Sonora, he saw what he thought was something that was very interesting and that was a specific hotel and uh, if you look carefully it says Gringo Pete's Congo Congo Hotel Gringo Pete's Congo Hotel he stopped he took a photograph of it he said I'm sending this to Elder Wilson to tell him that you have a moonlighting job <clears throat> well, what he did do is he let Elder Wilson know what my new name is, but he didn't talk to him much about my new moonlight. I'm going to ask Alan if you would do me a favor and just open this while I tell you a little story. The story I'm going to share with you touched my heart very deeply. Recently, we had the privilege of being in Russia. Russia in January separates the missionaries from the tourists. <laughs> and we traveled through snow, which was this deep. And uh, we had wonderful people helping us. And thank you so much. I have another wonderful person helping me now. And uh, <clears throat> we landed up in a little place, well actually it's a very big historic place, called St. Petersburg. And as we were in St. Petersburg, we were there only for two nights, <clears throat> and we had the privilege of meeting with a small group of people who were interested in exactly what you are doing and what we are doing here, and that is health ministry. And as we were getting to know people, it was a little bit like it's been here as well. When you start out at a conference like this, 
people kind of look at you, wonder who you are, where you're coming from, what you're going to have to say. By the second day, they start to greet you more. And by the third day, they're almost sorry to see you go. Some of them may never will be sorry. But I think that basically, as we went into the meetings one morning, we saw a little boy, young fellow, must have been seven years of age, came along to these meetings with his parents. <coughs> Keenly wasn't a health ministry's director yet. And as he went by, I put my hand out to greet him, and he did the typical reaction of a well-trained child and ran to his mother. And I was a little concerned, but I also thought, well, I'm going to keep an eye on you. And when he got back to his mother, I could see he was looking around to see if I was looking at him. And if he caught me looking at him, he would look away. And this went on for a few hours, and then in the middle of the morning they said, and now we're going to go out for a walk. And this is in the snow. So we said to go out for a walk. And we actually needed that. And as we were walking along, I suddenly felt a thud on my back. And I turned around, and there was this little fellow had made a snowball and thrown it at me. And I was delighted because there was a connection which had taken place. And then after that connection, there were many more because he got a snowball back. <laughs> and then he got two snowballs because my mentor, Dr. Handysides, was there. And he would have had four snowballs if Kathleen had been there and Fred had been there. And so it went. And then he ended up coming backwards and forwards. He would sit with his mother and father and they would pay attention. And he was busy doing little drawings. And then along he came at the end of the second day. And he gave me this, and this is the piece of paper he gave me. A little piece of yellow paper with hearts stamped on the back of them. And inside... Now remember, this is a little Russian boy. He writes, Dear Peter, love, I love you, Bogdan. That was his name. Bogdan means gift of God. You know, I learned a very important lesson that day. I learned the lesson that we talk about relationships. But do we always practice them? When I got that note from that little boy, I thought that we should quite readily answer the question which has been asked. What's so important about relationships? Well, the important thing about relationships is that they are the indispensable ingredient. Now, I've been enjoying the food we've been served. And I watched with quite a lot of interest, there was a carrot cake for dessert at lunchtime. And I purposed in my heart not to partake of it. But the woman that the Lord gave Dr. Handsides, she gave me to eat and I did. <laughs> or four little forkfuls, but she gave it to me and I ate them. But if that carrot cake didn't have the vital ingredient of carrots in it, it would not have been a carrot cake. So the relationships are the vital in ingredient of how we work with each other. We so often spend a lot of time and a lot of money in planning our strategy and in planning our outreach, in planning our health ministries, in planning the work that we do to reach the world. And yet we don't connect with them the way we should. You know, the word says, it was not good that man should be alone. And that is so true. Not good that man should be alone. If human mankind is to realize its creative intention, and I'm going to
draw from Elder Rodrigue, Dr. Rodrigue's talk this morning. Our creative intention is to reach a potential. We have a potential with the liberty to choose. Humankind must then be understood as a social kind. To be human is to be in relationship with one another. You know the relationship that comes just from the look across a room. The relationship that comes from saying thank you to someone who does something for you. The relationship that comes from being sensitive to the needs of people around us. Research has confirmed that the importance of human bonds is so real. Without relationships, we wither and we die, both emotionally and physically. The quality of our life diminishes when there is no one to share it with. If you have no one to share it with, no friend, no family, no spouse, we wither and die. Everything about us was designed to live in community and interaction with others. We were not to go through life emotionally disconnected. I want to ask you just for a moment, after you've had a lovely supper and a busy day and a long day of talks, think about one or two of the relationships that are most important to you. And what you would do if they were not there. This is an anecdotal experience. It's a true story. The saving hug. The rescuing hug. The story of a set of premature twins. One was stronger than the other one. The one, they were in two separate incubators. One was beginning to thrive. And the other one was not taking its food, its heart rate was very uh, unstable, it wasn't doing well, its temperature was abnormal. And the nurse who was looking after them broke all the hospital rules. As she saw that the more frail of the two twins wasn't doing well, she took the healthy one and put it in the same incubator as the one who was struggling. From that moment when that, the stronger one went in, you can see what happened. The arm went round. This was not done by the nurse. It was a reaction of the healthy twin. It embraced its twin. From that moment, the heart rate settled. The temperature improved. The baby began to thrive. And things went well. Now, scientifically, I find that difficult to understand and to explain. And I don't have a controlled trial to share with you, but it's a story which made the news. But it's a wonderful story because it illustrates the importance of relationships. We're not equipped to face life alone especially difficult aspects of life. We're not equipped for it, nor are we designed for it. Recently, while I was traveling, I met a man who is deeply involved in family ministries, and one of the things that is his basic interest is the issue of relationships and connectedness. And he shared with me a book called The Medical Consequences of Loneliness, which is a book about life and death, love, companionship and health and loneliness that can break the human heart. It touches on the complex themes that are in some ways as old as mankind itself. But its purpose is simple. To document the fact that reflected in our hearts there is a biological basis for our need to form loving human relationships. If we fail to fulfill that need, our lives are in pain. Now the scientists are beginning to tell us this. We've been encouraged to have relationships for a long, long time. When people are lonely and don't have companionship, almost every cause of death is significantly influenced by the lack of that companionship. 
And here's something I wanted to share with you word for word out of the book, and forgive the quote, it's a long one, but it's one which is very fitting, because when we come to health ministry summits, we spend a lot of time on what we eat and what we don't eat, and that's important. But there are other things. We, and we have an entire generation that has been raised to believe that dieting, exercise, inoculations, and other preventive care are the means to avoid disease and premature death. Well, they do. They do. But the idea that another crucial element influencing well-being is the ability to live together, to maintain human relationships. You know, it seems strangely unscientific. But God said right in the beginning, it is not good that what? Man should be alone, or woman should be alone. Yet that is the thesis of this book, the book called The Medical Consequences of Loneliness. Because loneliness and isolation can literally break your There are many studies, and we're going to say, share some of them with you tonight. The epidemiological studies, psychological studies, sociological studies, that show the importance of being in good relationship. And maybe we should dive right in and see what has been shown. What does the science say? Well, the great sociologist Abraham Maslow has shown that and commented that love is as essential to the whole growth of the human being as our vitamins, minerals, and proteins. Did you get that? So love, as important as it is for us to have breakfast, lunch, and supper, so important it is for us to have good relationships, for us to grow in every aspect. Well, there's a lot of studies that show that. And it's wonderful to have the science to back it up. Because sometimes we're a little bit like Thomas. We don't believe until we place our hands on the literature. The National Longitudinal Study is a study which showed very great importance in the issue of connectedness. Connectedness meaning our relationships one with another. How we connect, how we relate, how we communicate emotionally with each other. And they studied 72,000 students and this study was, was described initially in the late 1970s in the Journal of the American Medical Association and has been a seminal study I just this very afternoon went back to the literature to see how many times it's been cited in how many papers. It's one of, it's a seminal paper. 72,000 students were surveyed and they looked at at-risk behaviors. At-risk behaviors, their relationship to drug use, delinquency, and premature sexual involvement and experimentation. And they found some very interesting things. Young people who reported feeling connected to a parent or to an individual of significance in their lives, that could be a parent, a pastor, a teacher, a family member, are protected from emotional distress. They're protected from suicidal attempts. Now, it may or may not be happening in your part of the world, but it's coming. Young people, despite the fact that we are living in probably the most technologically connected age of all ages, are disconnected. Suicide rates are going up in young people. So those who are connected have decreased emotional distress, decreased suicidal thoughts attempt, decreased use of alcohol, tobacco, and marijuana, and decreased sexual activity. Do you want your church to look like this? Do you? I do. I want my church to have protection. And that's why we're talking about relationships. We want our church, we want our young people to have this protection. Well, if we're going to have them have it, we need to connect with them. We need to look at them in the eye. We need to learn to know their names. We need to speak to them as though they're some like Bogdan, that little boy, just learning to know his name, just looking at him, just greeting him, just letting him know that he was important enough, changed the whole uh, dynamic. At the end of the meeting, two days after he was going to leave, he pulled his parents and said, come, I want to have photographs with those two fellows. It works. You know it works. 
We need to do it. We need to practice it. Now, here's another very important thing. When we look at studies, we want to know if the outcomes of the studies are applicable in different parts of the world, across ethnicity, across gender, and across religious faith-based groups. And guess what they found? That when young people are connected, it doesn't matter whether you're a Catholic or a Jew or an Adventist or a Muslim or a Hindu, if you're connected with somebody who is significant in your life, it works. It doesn't matter what your race is. It doesn't matter what your socioeconomic status is. If there's connectedness in your life to someone of importance, you are protected and it builds into what we call resilience. So what is connectedness? Connectedness is a relationship. It's how people interact with each other. Relationships link and connect. And so, I'm going to get you to say this with me every time that slide comes up. They are indispensable. Do you want to say it? They are indispensable. I, want, I, I can see some of those who speak English not saying it. They are indispensable. And I really want you to leave this place believing it. Because it's true. But don't just know it. Don't just acknowledge it. You see, this is where we have the knowledge behavior disconnect. <laughs> we ask the question how many people exercise regularly? And in a group like this, most of you will raise your hands because, you know, we're embarrassed not to. <laughs> and we ask how many of you know that it's good? How many of you know that it's good to exercise regularly? Everybody knows it. But if we then ask the question, how many of us do it? That's where the disconnect comes. Don't let that disconnect come with you and me as we leave this place. Go back to our churches and forget that we need to put it into practice. Here's another one. Looking at a different kind of relationship. The relationship between a spouse and the other spouse. The Case Western Reserve study is a very interesting study. They took 10,000 men who had no evidence in their hearts or in their vascular system of coronary artery disease. Now you saw the, the uh, movie that Dr. Deal showed this morning of the, uh, what coronary arteries look like when they're really, really sick. These men had the risk factors, but they were not yet sick. They took them and they looked at the, uh, how things turned out and they looked at their risk factors, particularly they looked at cholesterol, high blood pressure, their age, presence or absence of diabetes, and they also looked to see if there were any abnormalities on their resting electrocardiogram. Now these people have not yet had a heart attack or angina or one of those events. They then asked the question, These men were 20 times more likely to develop new angina in the next five years. So you take all these individuals with all their risk factors, these 10,000 men, and they were then studied because they were more likely than not to have an event in the next five years. They then asked them a very particular question. They asked them, do you know and feel that your wife loves you? Do you know that your wife loves you? What question? I see some of the smiles which worry me a little bit. <laughs> well, it should worry you because look what happened to those who said that they did not feel that their wife showed them love developed angina twice as frequently. So women, please don't try and kill off your husbands. That's not the purpose of this talk. The purpose is not to tell you how to get rid of them. It's the purpose is to tell you how to help them live longer. But we can see that in those who had the evidence that their wives or their spouse cared for them, 
had a much smaller event rate than those who didn't. You see, this shows that we are in need of a loving relationship as a buffering factor, even more so as the risks are increased. And so the conclusion that we might draw, if we really want to take this to the logical conclusion, is that love and Twinkies is much better than broccoli and bad feelings. <laughs> I don't know what the nutritionists feel about that, but I think that's probably true. <laughs> the effect of social relationships on our health are the same regardless of our age, gender, or initial status of health. So it's not only young people in the uh, longitudinal study. It's not only the men in the Case Western Reserve study. It's everybody. No matter of their age, no matter of their gender, um, we are social beings, and if we're not able to express that for reasons within our control or not, we start to die. <coughs> this is just a little reminder of the National Longitude about the children who were connected. Sorry, it seems to be duplicated. Not only do we need connection to each other, but there are other aspects outside of our family where we need to be connected. And this is where the church plays a huge role, where our schools play a huge role, teachers, pastors, role models, outstanding teachers. These are relationships that build resilience in young people. Now we've mentioned the name resiliency. I don't know what it translates to, but resiliency is the ability to cope under difficult circumstances. And young people face difficult circumstances many times in their lives. They face it during puberty, as they move into adolescence, for example. They face it when they change schools. They change it when they move houses. They change it when their parents move jobs or lose jobs. They face it when their families break up. So res resilience, the ability to face difficult times, difficult circumstances, and young people who have that ability, those layers of protection, are able to survive those really very difficult times. They maintain competent functioning, and the support of relationships promotes self-respect and the resiliency. The critical element though, and what we want you to take home with you, the practical take home message, is that the development of resilience is as a result of a close relationship with at least one individual of significance. Parent, child, teacher, spouse. Positive relationships build resilience. They help young people. They help older people. We need to work with them. We need to connect with them. We need our young people to know that we don't regard them as the church of tomorrow, but as the church of today. That we have them represented in our church boards. That we talk to them about the plans for our church. That we mention them by name. That we show them. That we care for them. Right now, it's probably not happening as much in this territory as it is in others. But we have in our churches, in the church that I go to and that I love very much, we have the people that they call the Q-tips. Do you know what a Q-tip is? It's a thing you put in your ear to clean it. You know it's got a white cotton wool on the end of it? They look a little bit like me. Their hair's this color. Gray-haired people. Paying good tithes. Giving good offerings. Singing old songs. <coughs> but our young people. Yes. We spend time debating the issue of whether we should eat cheese or tofu. And our young people are drinking alcohol. We spend debating time as to the length of our dresses. And our young people are finding comfort with friends who accept them just as they are. Social relationships of the lack thereof 
constitute a major risk factor. In fact, some people have gone as far as to say that when your social relationships are not in place and as they should be, it probably has the same risk on your life in shortening it as smoking 15 cigarettes a day would do. Now that surprised me when I read that. But I have another surprise for you, just as a matter of interest to balance the surprises. You can be a vegetarian and a non-smoker and a non-drinker. And if you don't exercise, it probably is the same as smoking 20 cigarettes a day anyway. What we're pointing out is that there are risk factors which we traditionally don't recognize. And the issue of relationships is a very important one, or the lack of it, and how loneliness intervenes. The quantity and quality of social relationships in, in industrial societies are decreasing. And you're going to find in the areas where you live, I had an amazing visit to Mexico. Enjoyed it. Saw industriousness. Saw busyness. Saw people working hard. Hotels busy. Airports busy. People running to and fro. And I thought to myself, industrialized societies, relationships are decreasing. And you know, despite the technology which we have, and we all have them all, many of us have them, and if we don't have them, we covet them, we want them, we need them, we need the iPhone, we want the iPad. But we don't have the eye contact. We don't have the eye contact. And our young people, although they're living in this most connected era, and our older ones, I want to challenge you. When you next go to the airport, or you're sitting in a restaurant, in a hotel, or wherever it may be, watch how couples communicate with each other. One sits on one side with a cell phone, and one sits on the other side with a cell phone, and they're looking at this, and they don't look at each other. I watch them in the, business, in the, in the lounges as we travel. I watched the other day, just a few days ago, a husband and wife, clearly husband and wife, came in and sat across the table from each other and they'd gotten themselves something to drink and they'd gotten some food and put it on the table and she sat with her iPad and he sat with his newspaper. No communication. They didn't say one word in half an hour to each other. relationships. Maybe he, she was preparing him for a heart attack. <laughs> or maybe he was preparing her for one. I want to share with you as we come towards the, although we've still got plenty of time, they told me we can go to one o'clock in the morning. <laughs> no, they didn't. There's a concept called hardwired to connect. When we look at what we learned about this morning in our devotional, some of the experiences I've shared with you, some of the scientific commentary, the concept has come out that we are hardwired to connect. We are made, we are designed, we are fabricated to connect with each other. We are built to live in community. We are built to have relationships. And in the United States, there's been this very interesting commission looking at the Commission on Children at Risk, and it's entitled Hardwired to Connect. And I will give Belkis the PDF of the book. I have it with me, which you can have. You can get it from her. It's a PDF. It's in English but I think many of you will manage to use it very well. It uh, talks about the study of looking at children who are being studied because of the risk. And the outset of the book says the following, in the midst of unprecedented material affluence, large and growing numbers of US children and adolescents are failing to flourish, 
more and more young people are suffering from mental illness, emotional distress, and behavioral problems. We see important rises in depressive thoughts, emotional disturbances, and increased suicide rates, anxiety. We are using medications and psychotherapies. We are designing more and more special programs for at-risk children. These are necessary, but they are not enough. So what we're doing is we are trying to paint the rash. Sometimes some diseases, for example measles, presents with a rash. It doesn't help to take an ointment and paint it on the rash. It's going to make no difference. But what we're doing with our young people when they face all these issues of disconnectedness, of emotional problems, of anxiety, of depression, of increasing suicide, we're putting more and more programs and treatments in place. Whereas what they need is they need the following. In large measure, what's causing this crisis is a lack of connectedness. A lack of connectedness. We mean two kinds of connectedness, and this is very crucial. I don't want you to leave this place thinking that it's just merely greeting the young people. It's not merely knowing their names. It's not merely having a relationship with them. It's being connected to the young people, but having them connected to a spiritual, firm foundation, as we know it in Jesus. So the two things that young people need to be connected to, number one is to each other and someone of significance. Number two is to God. And that's what the uh, National Longitudinal Studies show. That young people need connectedness to each other and to God. That's what this study is showing. Similarly, that um, there needs to be that connectedness. They make reference to a growing amount of research in biology, neuroscience, and a range of other disciplines that are shedding light on these systems, saying, in a very real sense, hardwire in human beings the need for enduring and, and nurturing relationships. We had that need in us. And the reason I'm repeating it is because I want us to remember it. It's not an optional extra. It's not something you can say, well, we went to that conference and, well, we'll take this thing and we'll use that and we'll throw that one out. If we lose out on the application of relationships in our lives, not only with our young people, but when it comes to the issues of working with our communities, our communities are going to know if we're really interested in them for themselves or we just want to swell the numbers of our church. Do we do smoking cessation because we love them and want them to have the opportunity to know Jesus? Or we do it only if they become good Seventh-day Adventists? Our relationships are going to be the telling way in which we will know. You see, the idea is that we're really born to form attachments. That our brains are physically wired to develop in tandem with another's through emotional communication, beginning before words even are spoken. Have you got that relationship with people, some people in your life, that you can actually see them and you know what they're thinking in a given circumstance? It can be very worrying. It can be very worrying. My wife knows me so well. And just the other evening, we were making the decision as whether we were going to have a piece of chocolate before we went to bed or not. And I said, you know, I've been exercising and I've been watching the scale. I'm not going to. She looked at me as only my loving wife can do. She said, you know, sometimes I like you when you're not so worried about your weight more than when you are. But to have that relationship with people where as you... Look at them. Before you have to say a word, there's an understanding. That's what we were hardwired to do. 
not only in our marriages, in our families, in our schools, in our churches, in our communities. So the people will say, we want to be like them because they are like Jesus. The Pharisees accused Jesus. They said, this man eats with sinners. Maybe we should be doing the same thing. For too long, young people have been told that their greatest problems are drugs, sex, and alcohol. These are, in fact, only symptoms of a much greater disease. The disease of youth is that their key relationships are in disarray. Their relationships with God, self, parents, friends, and the world. So we need something new. We need to give something, we need to give them a legacy of a model which is focused on a network of nurturing and supportive relationships. To invest in the community and capacity to strengthen family relationships. We need to have what they call authoritative communities where there is structure, where we not only send the young people to do things, we do it with the young people. We don't say, here's some service for you to go and do. We say, come, let us go and do service together. Those are the areas where change is going to come. And the outcomes, striving for a personal, empowering relationship with God, unleashes the potential for profound significance in relationships with others. So as we have a relationship with Him, it facilitates our relationships with one another. And that makes such sense, doesn't it? What is the purpose of our Bible study and our prayer life? It's to communicate with Him, to know Him, to love Him, and then to serve Him. They'll bring abundance to our being and meaning to every person we encounter. I love... I sought permission from Elder Rodriguez to allude to his speech this morning when I talked about our potential to develop and the freedom to choose. He said, are you going to plagiarize me? I said, well, I'm following a great example. He plagiarized this good lady so much this morning. I thought I should do the same this evening. <laughs> I have his forgiveness and his blessing. If we would humble ourselves before God, be kind, and courteous and tender-hearted and pitiful there would be 100 conversions to the truth where now there is only one <clears throat> and yet we look for more programs we look for more opportunities where she says to us it's as simple as this kind and courteous. I want to share with you just a brief experience. I had the privilege of pastoring a church while I was in um, medicine, cardiology in Johannesburg. I did Bible studies each Sabbath with a lady who came quite a long distance to the church where we were. And I saw her only on the, on the Sabbath. So directly after church, she would stay we would do the Bible study, and then she would go home. And after we'd been through all the studies, we actually got to the point where she was ready for baptism. And I noticed that there was a, a loneliness about her. She loved the Bible study. She loved to stay. She loved to join in the potlucks, especially when they were there. Came the day for the baptism. Baptized her. And as she came up out of the water, I hugged her, and she burst into uncontrollable crying and sobbing. And I said to her, I said, you know, I'm, I apologize. I didn't mean to, to offend you. She said, you didn't offend me. She said, you see, you didn't know, and nobody else knows. I'm HIV positive. 
My family knows. I haven't been hugged in the last five years. What are my relationships like? What is my connectedness to one another? And you will have this test as you leave this place. It's not a test of exams. It's not a test of coding the literature. But it's a test from the Word of God. Which says, by this shall who know? You know who will know by this? My wife will know. She's the one who knows me best. You may think you know me, you don't. But it says, by this shall all men know. You are my disciples. If you have love, one for another. So in this whole thing of relationships, of committing ourselves to knowing people by name, of connecting with them, of connecting to the source of power, there's one more indispensable ingredient. Remember we started out by saying that a carrot cake is not a carrot cake unless there's a carrot in it. Yeah. Relationships are not going to work without you and me in those relationships. A committed you will work. Try it and see because you see, we've been told it's not good for men to be alone. God bless you as you understand and as you ponder the importance of relationships in your ministry and your personal lives.